in general. Uh, we'll talk about this some more, but as you know, as we're going along here, you need to have some familiar, familiarity with FNA procedures. This is actually the NRAD device that holds the patient in screen. And again, you can use FNA to sample either solid or cystic lesions of the breast. And you already have had some exposure to how to prepare these questions. I hope you've all had a chance to go out on some FNA procedures. You're going to be the ones not putting the needles in the place. Okay. Don't let, let anyone ever tell you that you are capable of doing it. You probably could be capable of doing it, but you're not credentialed to do that. So that's the truth. So, but you will be there as part of, of the team to help prepare the child, which is most important, actually. It doesn't do any good if you get a good sample. If you don't get a good preparation, you know, it doesn't do, do you any good. Uh, FNA can be done in, in uh, just some general guidelines. And this is an FNA of a top, superficial palpable mass. Um, and generally, you insert the needle into the lesion through the skin, you apply suction. Actually, I usually put a, I usually will draw about one milliliter out of the pencil to then let that be filled with air. So I can use that to kind of expel the material from the screen afterwards onto the, the glass slide. So I already have one cc withdrawn before I even put the needle into the, the lesion. Then you apply suction. Now, breast lesions do require, uh, generally do require suction because they tend to be dense, firmer, uh, not like the thyroid, which is very bloody. You know, usually in the thyroid, I tend not to use any suction, but in the breast, I tend to need to use suction. Uh, of course, you want to release the suction before you pull the needle out from the lesion because if you don't, you suck up all those cells into the syringe where you can't get access to them. So that's an important point. And then, of course, we um, expel the material onto the glass slide. I don't recommend detaching the needle, because that's how you get stuck and have other accidents you don't want to, you want to avoid. Um, but if you put that one cc of air in the syringe beforehand, that will actually help you in expelling the material onto the glass slide. All right, what are the indications for breast deficit? Well, evaluation of any palpable breast mass. Now, the radiologists also use FNAs to evaluate non-palpable breast mass. But pathologists are, and, and actually it depends, some pathologists have been credentialed to do ultrasound-guided techniques and so are capable of doing ultrasound-guided breast FNAs once they have that uh, training and that uh, competency assessment. Um, so I'm not going to say that anymore, that pathologists don't do image-guided ones, but pathologists can do ultrasound-guided FNAs. Will help distinguish between inflammatory and neoplastic processes between benign and malignant lesions. Uh, it can be therapeutic. As I mentioned earlier, you can stick a needle in a cyst and evacuate it, and, it, and that's all you need to do. Um, uh, you certainly can identify typical lesions that may require additional uh, follow up sampling, like a biopsy, before more definitive procedures. It can help facilitate pre surgical or neoadjuvant treatment planning for patients with a new diagnosis of breast cancer, and it can be used to confirm metastatic or recurrent disease, because breast cancer can recur locally, um, and we can, uh, can metastasize to other lymph nodes, and we can call the number of times to either do an FNA on a palpable lesion, a superficial palpable lesion, or assist with a, an image-guided one to diagnose this kind of uh, either metastatic or recurrent disease. Now, the overall accuracy of breast FNA, it's, it's, it's actually very good. And on average, if you look at this is from a large series of studies uh, that looked at accuracy, the average was 90%. Um, and this is for superficial, non-image guided uh, FNAs uh, of palpable lesions. Now, in the, in the best scenario, actually, this rate can get down to as low, below 5%. Uh, I should say the false negative rate can usually get below 5%. And this is what we try to shoot for, really, with experienced aspirators to keep it below 5%. Our actual um, laboratory goal is to have it 10% or less, but 
you like, you know, in the best setting and the most experienced aspirators, you want to keep that false negative rate less than 5%. False positive rates are even are usually much lower. And in the in, in, in an average very point point four to one percent. You don't want to over call aggressive because what does that mean for the patient? If you call something positive and it's not, that patient can get a mastectomy, okay, based on that result. So you you know, you wanna be really wary about that. But overall average accuracy is about ninety percent, which is pretty good. Um, it's uh, safe. I've mentioned SAFE before, which stands for Simple, Accurate, Fast, Autonomic, Efficient, Approach to Acronym for All Acronyms, not just for Acronyms, Hensley Therapeutics. It can sometimes provide relief for the patient's anxiety, at least it kind of gets the, the, the ball rolling as far as an assessment and provides some comfort to the patient. And certainly, because uh, it can be done quite rapidly, you know, the patient can come into general surgery clinic and they'll call us and say, hey, we need an acronym today. That's the usual, right? They don't schedule ahead of time. We are on call 24-7, basically, according to the surgeon. So they call us down. But again, that helps the patient in some regards because, you know, when they get referred to general surgery clinic and they have a palpable mass, they're very worried. You know, think about yourself or how your wife or your, your mother would feel with a palpable mass, you know? It's very anxiety provoking. And so sometimes if it turns out, what if it turns out to be just a cyst? And you can tell that right away. That certainly provides some anxiety relief for the patient. And certainly you can use it to evaluate palpable and non-palpable lesions. And usually non-palpable are samples with image guidance, as I mentioned before. Now, again, false negatives and false positives do occur, and we like to try and prevent that as much as possible, but you have to, you have to realize that, that sometimes it's unavoidable, even in the best circumstances. Um, sampling errors are probably the most common reason for false negative diagnosis. Uh, smaller lesions and bigger lesions actually tend to have more false negative results. When you have a big lesion, you want to make sure that you sample different areas, and they tend to become necrotic, so you, 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 you've got to try to avoid the necrotic areas, etc. Uh, if they're in the deep or upper, deep upper quadrants of the breast, they can be hard to get to. You might need a bigger, longer needle without actually puncturing the chest wall. That can cause some anemophilus. But you gotta, you know, you gotta keep in mind where the location of the lesion is and make sure that it's palpable if you're doing it uh, for that reason. Um, it depends on how fibrotic the lesion is. If there's cystic sphincromatosis, can also hinder getting an adequate cellular preparation. And of course, it depends on the degree of differentiation that the tumor, if there is one there, that can, can cause some uh, false negative results. In fact, um, what is the most common lesion that tends to, maybe the, I think the fellow telling me, so I guess the fellow, what would be the most common uh, breast tumor that shows up as a false negative in the breast definition? Lobular, exactly. Lobular carcinoma, because it's not very cellular, the cells tend to be very bland, so you don't expect them to be, you know, you're not expecting them to be outright malignant, you know, so it's easy to undercall them as being malignant. So lobular, yes. Um, of course, slide preparation is always important. Experience is important in doing FMOs, and, and you don't want to overcall, undercall, and you certainly want to have good techniques to get a sample. Now, false positives also occur in, in again, uh, this usually it's an misinterpretation of some atypical proliferative lesions, but sometimes it's challenging because some proliferative hyperplastic lesions can have some overlapping features with very low-grade uh, in situ carcinomas. So there's always that gray zone in there. It's never always black and white, right? And so it uh, can be challenging. You don't want to overcall poorly preserved material. I mean, you don't want to overcall if there's only a very few cells present. Know, be wary of that. You know, don't make a malignant diagnosis on one cell. You have to have two, right? Yep. <laughs> so we would hope there would be more. And, and of course, experience is important. So what's the most common breast lesion for false positive results? Fiber adenoma. That's right. Very good. Um, there's just two fiber adenomas tend to be very cellular, as you'll see in a, in a little bit. And, and can have occasional isolated cells, single cells, um, and that can be overcalled, and they can sometimes have some cytological features. But that is, they are the most common reason for a false 
positive diagnosis of cancer on psychology. All right, so in general, know your own limits. You know. First of all, know what your surgeon at your hospital is going to do with a positive ethanolazole, because it varies from location, and it varies depending upon your experience and their confidence in your experience. Too. So it really varies from site to site. Um, the, uh, at Fancy, if we tell them it's a malignant, they're going to pretend they want to do definitive surgery, which doesn't always mean a mastectomy. It could mean a lump but still, that's a definitive surgical procedure. So just be wary of what your surgeons are going to do. You know, you save positive results for those patients who feel you're most comfortable in a potential mastectomy outcome. Save the negative diagnosis for adequate aspects, adequate which explain the lesion. And, you know, you've got to work close in this case, and you've got to know your physical exam and imaging findings. It's the triple test approach here is very important in breast ethanol. I never sign out a breast ethanol without knowing the clinical exam and without knowing the radiologic findings. That is so important. Now, that, that's actually true for all of psychology, as far as ethanol psychology, as far as I'm concerned, but it's especially true in the breast. Okay, so how do we assess adequacy of breast ethanol? As you know, we, got, we always encourage all non gyms to do, we do adequacy assessment by and by. Um, but how do we interpret that? It's kind of a controversial area in breast ethanol psychology. It's not like the Bethesda system for breast, uh, like thyroid, you know, for breast. So there's an NCI guidelines book out there. I don't think you guys got that picture that came up, but I've got one here. I'd be so nice to grab it to make a copy later on and for, for them. If you guys want to make it, I got an extra copy here. And so this is actually, um, I've taken a lot of the adequacy assessment recommendations and, and techniques and also um, some diagnostic terminology taken right from this article. It's actually from 1997, but it's the best article around uh, for evaluation of breast ethanol. And uh, so I just see. And so the NCI group, um, uh, so there's controversy on whether to actually count the cells or not. There's some groups, the counselors recommend yes, you should have at least six groups of duct. So the cell that you need is the ductal epithelial cell. Okay, that's the cell you want to see to call it adequate. Um, the counters recommend at least six groups of at least six cells each that are well preserved in a, on a given smear. But there's folks that actually take the non-counting, and this is pathology, that take the non-counting approach. They want to make sure that the ethanol explains the clinical lesion. Right? Because remember, you can have cystic lesions that may not have a lot of epithelial cells. They may not have any at all. Now, if they have applicant cells, is that adequate? And I've been talking about ductal cells, but what if the fibrocystic lesion has applicant cells? Yeah. Because guess what they remember what applicant cells represent? It's just metaplastic ductal cells. So it still is count. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk about we'll see some more examples of that. So it's kind of it varies depending upon um, who you read, but the NCI group kind of takes the leaves it up to the aspirator as to which approach they want to take. And at Fancy, we tend to I like to see a certain number of groups of cells. And it's always about six or seven groups I want to see that are well preserved. If it's less than that, then it's not, it's not adequate. If I call it unsatisfactory, I, I tell them why. You know, is it not because of the cells? Is it degenerated? Is it yada yada. All right. So again, I was mentioning the NCI recommendations here. They also recommend in the, the NCI group that the specimen description should include quantity of epithelial cells, either a few, moderate, or abundant. And a few is just an occasional cluster. Is abundant. It's, you know, you see epithelial cells in almost every field. And again, we try to keep the inadequate, unsatisfactory specimen rate less than 20%. That's actually the recommendation from the NCI group for uh, maintenance of healthcare provider credentials. They feel that if it's ever higher than that, then whoever is the aspirator is not doing a very good job. Okay? So you should keep some epithelial cells. All right, any questions on that? So, in general, Again, you've seen some of these things before. We approach psychology um, from 
you know, looking at the overall cellular, you're looking at the individual cells, looking at the back, this isn't anything new. In the breast, though, we're going to focus in on a, different, on, on a few other things. Um, first of all, you want to assess the overall cellularity and how the cells are arranged. Are they in groups? Are they in flat sheets? Are they individual cells? And the most important thing also in breast is, are there myoepithelial cells present? We talked about them earlier as indicated as a sign of benignancy. I can say that word. The sign of it being benign. <laughs> And so if you see myoepithelial cells present, that's always a good finding and will help you in the overall interpretation. So you have to learn to recognize them. If, are there intact single epithelial cells present? I say intact, meaning that they have cytoplasm present. Nor, in a normal benign breast, you, you generally should not see a lot of intact single epithelial cells. You see lots of groups that are cohesive but not a lot of single cells. And if you start to see single cells in nuclear tissue, that should always raise a red flag. <laughs> but if you look at the overall nuclei, is there pleomorphism, are there nucleoli, is there chromatin clumping, etc. Are there other cells present with the cells? Because uh, remember what we said, if we said it had a high grade uh, carcinoma with lots of lymphocytes in the background, that might indicate what kind of tumor? Medullary cells. You already know the psychology. Okay, so or, um, of course, you want to see the background. Is it clean or dirty? Just like everything else. All right, so normal. First of all, let's, let's discuss normal breast psychology. Um, again, we don't. Generally, when we see normal breast psychology, it's because the normal breast tissue is being sampled next to an abnormal lesion. So you're not just going to be an echinacea, the heck of it, right? <laughs> so, but when you get nine breast psychology, these are the kind of things you should, um, that you'll notice. The specimen is not usually very cellular. You still need to have adequate number of groups, which is usually about six, um, but if it's, if it's, and that's, that's not a very cellular specimen, so it's usually scantily cellular. Uh, there are usually honeycomb sheets of cohesive, now remember this, flat honeycomb sheets of cohesive glandular cells, just like normal glandular cells anywhere else in the body. They're small. They average six to ten. They, they, uh, they average six to ten uh, microns in diameter. The nuclei are round to oval with smooth nuclear membranes, vesicular chromatin with regular chromatin distribution and inconspicuous nucleoli. Now, myoepithelial cells are often in the background. They look like naked bipolar nuclei. They actually look like little footballs that are hyperchromatic. We'll see those in just a moment. And then, of course, it's not uncommon to see some adipose and stromal tissue fragments as well. Now, the, the, the nuclear size of these glandular cells is roughly that of a lymphocyte, uh, or about uh, one and a half times an RBC, just for size one. Okay. All right, so here's normal, benign, buccal epithelial cells. It's a nice, flat, honeycomb sheet like you see in normal, benign glandular cells. It's cohesive. There's no single cells in the background. Um, they're very uniform from cell to cell, uh, round to oval, with uniform chromatin and indistinct nucleoli. So, again, the uniformity and the cohesion and the flatness without any overlapping are key features of benignity. Here's another group. Again, it's just a little larger group, but that's okay. Uh, again, note the cohesion, the lack of nuclear overlapping, the uniformity from cell to cell, and the very bland chromatin. We've got some neutrophils in the back of here. I actually don't see any amount of estimation, although there may be one right here kind of overlapping, but we'll see those in just a moment. Again, the myoepithelial cells are important. Those are your ductal epithelial cells. That's what you want to see to assess for adequacy. Myoepithelial cells, you don't have to have them for adequacy, but their presence is going to help favor the benign process. Um, because we tend to lose myoepithelial cells, particularly in invasive lesions. Now, these are very small, they're smaller than the ductal cells. They're oval in shape with bipolar features. In other words, you know, kind of like if you were to divide the cell in half, the, the, the nuclear ends would kind of be like near image. Each other. 
and they have, tend to have more hypochromation than ductal epithelial cells. That's why we, they kind of look like little footballs that are dark, darker than the ductal cells. And they tend to, they tend to lose their cytoplasm, so it's not uncommon to see them as naked nuclei in the background. Or, if you focus up and down on the ductal epithelial groups, you know, because they'll have a little bit of, yes, honeycomb sheets won't generally have a lot of depth of focus to them, but sometimes if you focus up and down on them, you'll appreciate these darker cells kind of uh, occurring, kind of associated with the epithelial groups, but out of the plane of the focus. So that's when you can see them as well. And you'll see those at the start, too. Uh, the other cells to look for are foam cells. They are multi-vaccinated foamy histiocytes and mastocytes. They're often found within ducts. We tend to see a lot of them in certain disorders, such as high resistance change, but they can be seen in normal aspects as well. You know, not many of them, but you have to get used to finding them. Again, foam cells is just another name for foamy mastocytes. And now here's some examples on this quick. We've got a stromal fragment here that the stroma on this quick is the same, a little metachromatically, like you see here. And then you've got all of these stripped naked oval nuclei. Those all represent myoepithelial cells in the background, and they tend to be isolated. Some are a little bit more spindle shaped than oval, but most of them are oval shaped with no cytoplasm. That's an important point. Here's another one. These are all myoepithelial cells. They're all stripped, naked, oval nuclei that are very uniform and small. Here they are on, cap, on, on a cap screen. And again, here they're a little bit more definitely oval in shape. A uh, little bit bigger than the RDCs, obviously, but um, not generally bigger than the ductal cells. I don't have any here in the background for comparison. But again, notice how uniform they are. And, and note that they don't have any cytoplasm. That's key. And the reason is is that the cytoplasm tends to be pretty fragile in itself. There's not a lot of it, not as much as ductal. Again, here's some more on this point. And once you see these, you tend to start seeing them everywhere. And occasionally you'll see one with a little rim of cytoplasm. That's not abnormal. Now, okay. Here they are associated. Now, this is actually looking at the same ductal epithelial group at different plane of focus. Here's one where we see the nice cohesive group of, of honeycomb glandular cells, you know, indicative of ductal epithelial cells, very uniform. And then you see, even here, you start to see some little bit darker, smaller, oval shaped nuclei in the background. But then when you go to a different focus, you see them all over the place. See that? All of these dark, oval nuclei. So you can have them associated with the groups here, or you can have them and or, so oftentimes you see both, you'll see them isolated in the background. Here's an example of foamy uh, macrophages or foam cells. Again, all they are are macrophages with abundant foamy cytoplasm, often with some cellular debris in them because they are phagocytic. Uh, we've got some other inflammatory cells in the background here, but again, this is probably from a patient with fibrous cystic chain. But, you know, I want to see some other things and know other things before I tell that. Or it could be from a patient with just, you know, a cyst. All right, what about, um, we talked a little bit about the African metaplastic cells earlier. And all they represent are metaplasia of the ductal cells. And you see them most commonly in the setting of fibrous cystic chain. They have abundant eosinophilic granular cytoplasm that can sometimes appear dense. Most often it's granular. Uh, it can look bluish, purple, or gray on this quick. It tends to have a rounder, eccentric displaced nucleus with a prominent nucleolus. So unlike normal ductal cells, it has a prominent nucleolus. It's similar to oncocytes we see elsewhere in the body. And sometimes you guys haven't had other, haven't really talked about oncocytes yet. Have you? Uh, you'll see similar cells in other organs, such as the thyroid. Um, in fact, in the in the, um, the thyroid, we call them a different name. They're called herbal cells, but they're, but they're all oncocytes, and we'll talk more about that later. Now, uh, African cells can also be can also show up as three-dimensional clusters or single cells, as well as flat sheets. 
So they, they can cluster together a little bit, a little bit of overlapping, but usually they have plenty of cytoplasm and which helps support those alignments. Uh, there's other cells we'll look at briefly here as well. Here's some good examples of African metaplastic cells. You know, they kind of resemble what cell you just recently studied a little bit. Hepatocytes, yeah, but they're not. They're big, big. But in fact, hepatocytes tend to be a little bit bigger yet, um, have a little bit even more denseness to their cytoplasm. But these actually almost kind of resemble them, don't they? And some of them are binucleated. Uh, and you can see nucleolite here pretty well, although they're not real plastic. Some of them are. But again, abundant granular cytoplasm, low NC ratio, which is good. You can notice another binucleated cell here. And this is in a flat sheet. Here's some more for comparison on cap stain. Here's some normal ductal cells here, and then some uh, African metaplastic cells right next to it. So nice contrast there. You notice the nuclei are slightly larger, and they have more abundant cytoplasm, and they have nucleolite that you can easily see. Here it is on the same thing on the um, uh, district here. Again, ductal cells here. Now there's a little bit of overlap here. You notice that there's a little bit of nuclear overlapping, but it's still a very cohesive group, which is a benign colony. And uh, the nuclei are pretty uniform throughout. And the reason why we're probably seeing a little bit of nuclear overlap in this group is because there's probably some hyperplasia going on, which is what you can see. And then these are the African metaplastic cells right here. All right, you can also sample fat because, you know, the breast tissue, breast is actually composed of a lot of fatty tissue. And these are just normal adipocytes, or, as you see here, large vacuoles with carefully placed small oval nuclei. If you see this on a breast definition, that's all you have. Is it an adequate specimen? It depends. Okay. It depends upon the lesion that's being sampled. Are they going after? a soft, mobile mass, and this person has a history of lipoma elsewhere, and you get all you get is fat back, well, it could be a lipoma, right? But if you palpate a very discrete, hard, non-mobile, thick mass, and all you get are different, I would say that is definitely not an adequate specimen, because that doesn't explain it. Okay? Fat is not hard like that. Okay? Unless it's undergone fat necrosis, but then that's a different appearance. All right, here's a stromal tissue. It's actually quite cellular, but um, it's not usually this cellular. But this is a fragment of stromal tissue, and then you've got your ductal cells over here. You, it's not uncommon to see some stromal tissue in the background. It often stays metastatic on the distal. All right, so that should be a basic cytology. Uh, we're going to uh, begin with looking at the non neoplastic lesions first, just like we did in the last lecture. So are there any questions so far about the normal cellular components in FNA in general? Okay. Well, going on to, um, uh, we're going to look at examples of each of these lesions. We talked about them at the last lecture, so I'm not going to go into uh, detail right now. I'm just going to show you some examples. So, first of all, acute mastitis. Again, what do we, I showed you this image before. What do we see? Acute inflammation requires basically this is a picture of cuts, okay? And if you see this, um, make sure you consider getting a sample for culture. And we can do that, F uh, culture FNA samples, as long as you um, place the needle output in a sterile saline solution in a sterile cup, then it's good to go. But you, say, but you gotta make sure you have that available. And usually the clinics do. Um, the one thing to be aware of with acute mastitis is that um, sometimes you'll have epithelial cells. Now, if I don't see any epithelial cells there, I'm not going to call it unsatisfactory. I know I said the rule earlier, you need to see some, but in this setting, if you're aspirating an acid, you may not see epithelial cells. And so in that setting, it would be fine not to have the epithelial cells. Now, if you do see epithelial cells, it's not uncommon to see some intipia in them because of all the reactive change. So you got to make sure you don't overcall malignancy, but there is commonly some reactive intipia. But in the right background, that, that shouldn't happen. Now, one thing to be there's unique to the breast is a type of abscess called the subaureolar abscess. Now, what are these cells right here? Huh? 
then I a nuclear split, so why are we speeding up? Well, now think about what the uh, remember the areola and the nipple aligns with stratified squamous epithelium. And it dips down a little bit into the most distal, um, I'm sorry, the most proximal, largest lacticular stuff. You know, the one that's closest to the nipple, that epithelium kind of dips into that area. So that area, when it gets inflamed and, and forms an abscess, it would not be uncommon to see some squamous associated with that inflammatory component. But the important thing is that the suballeolar abscess needs to be treated a little bit differently than a regular abscess. Sometimes they have to go in and drain them and excise them if they don't resolve. They tend to be a little bit more um, significant that way and that they may need a surgical um, a procedure rather than just antibiotics. So if you actually get an abscess with a nucleus claims or even mature claims, I think it's important to know because it's can sometimes they, they mean something different clinically. Here's another example. You gotta recognize flames on this quick too, right? Okay. And so yes, you have all these inflammatory cells in the background, but then you have these cells that look metaplastic here. And those are more immature flame cells. So it's important to recognize components. Uh, now we talked about fat necrosis earlier. Again, what do we see? A lot of foam cells. Now the foam cells can either represent the foamy macrophages or the degenerating adipocytes. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish the two. But oftentimes in this background, you'll see more typical looking adipocytes along with the macrophages that are more foamy and bacterial. Uh, you often have mixed inflammation in the background, maybe some blood vessels to indicate granulation tissue and some necrosis. Now, uh, we also talked about silicone mastitis and granulomatous inflammation earlier today. And basically, you're going to see what you see in granulomatous inflammation is for other things, including the presence of multinucleated giant cells, um, aggregates of epithelioid histiocytes, and also some mixed inflammation. But in addition, within the multinucleated histiocytes, you may see this, um, um, what, you know, these large vacuoles, which sometimes have this kind of um, refractile appearance to them as you focus up and down on them, still kind of clear, but have this kind of refractile nature to them, almost a crystalline appearance in a way. And, and that actually represents a silicone material. It doesn't show up very well, but you can still appreciate it within those vacuoles. So something to keep in mind. Now, what about breast tissue that's showing lactational changes? All right, now, you, I showed you the histology earlier of lactational change, and it's the, the, the lobules show a huge proliferation of ascular units. The cells show abundant cytoplasm lots of vacuoles, and lots of secretory material. So that's, guess what, that's what you're going to see on cytology as well. So here's an example of a lesion of the breast with lactational change. And I can almost suspect that from the very beginning, not even looking at the cells, just look at the background. Look at how bubbly and kind of micro-vesicular the background looks. That's actually indicative of all that secretory material that is often has a, a strong uh, and abundant lipid component. So you've got this kind of bubbly background that indicates the secretory material, but then you've got these cells that have abundant cytoplasm, uh, enlarged nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and lots of tiny vacuoles throughout the cytoplasm. Now, unlike normal ductal epithelial cells, these cells tend to show a little bit more discohesion, and you do tend to see some occasionally some single cells. So don't let that worry you too much. You have, you know, as long as they still have abundant cytoplasm and look like the other nuclei in the other groups, I wouldn't get too concerned about it. When I get concerned is when you start to see cells with higher NC ratio and uh, much more prominent nucleated tissue that might indicate a concurrent vessel placement. So, you know, yes, pregnant women can get breast cancer, so you have to be wary of that difference. But, you know, if you've got this classic background and these classic findings, then I, I, I wouldn't be too concerned unless you see a group of cells that looks totally different, okay, and yet shows malignant features. So you've you got to be wary of that. 
All right, here's another example of Epstein. Again, notice how much cytoplasm the cells have, how foamy they are, evacuated. Uh, notice the watery background indicative of all the secretory material. Notice how the cytoplasm, you know, it gets pretty fragile, and sometimes you'll see scripts making the CI. And here, that's the same So occasionally you'll see a script in the nucleus, and it won't represent a mile X, but it'll represent these cells here uh, that have lost some of their fragile cell function. Here it is on higher power again. Notice the prominent nucleoli, the multiple the, uh, evacuated cytoplasm, the large nucleoli, the abundant cytoplasm, etc. But notice how it's still cohesive, this group. It's still cohesive. That's a good sign. All right, any questions on those changes? We're going to uh, move on then to fiber cystic changes. Uh, again, remember, fiber cystic changes encompasses a whole spectrum of findings. Uh, we're going to focus on the simple ones first here. Now, simple fiber cystic changes will show a combination of things. And that's kind of the thing that you're going to notice from the beginning. It's kind of a mixture of findings, cellular findings. That mixture is a helpful finding towards something potentially benign. You're going to see flat sheets of ductal cells, usually not very many of them. So don't expect these to be very cellular unless they're hyperplastic, you know, really hyperplastic, okay? Um, Apical metaplasia is common, but you don't have to have it to call it fibrocystic changes. Yes, it's there, but if you don't have it, doesn't mean it's not fibrocystic changes, okay? Um, the myo apps are usually present. There's usually a few in the background, not a whole lot, but they'll be there. You can find them. Foam cells are not uncommon because you often have cystic change. And what do you see with cystic change? Lots of foam cells. And of course, the background, especially in the cystic region, often shows abundant proteinaceous material. So here's an example of classic fiber cystic changes. First of all, you notice the background looks kind of grungy. Not a diathesis, it's just a lot of proteinaceous material from the cystic changes that are occurring in this region. We also have lots of foamy macrophages. You can find them almost in every area. And then we have these groups of epithelial cells with the foamy eosinophil or granular cytoplasm. And there's clusters, there's smaller, there's large ones, there's small ones, there's an occasional individual one. And what are these cells again? Okay. What are these cells? What do they represent? Okay, remember how this is? What is a cell? What types of cells with granular eosinophil cytoplasm? African metaplastic cells. That's right. You have to know that one. Okay, because you know, you're going to see this kind of image again. <laughs> I'm sure of it. So, maybe not this exact one, but I'm sure you're going to you're gonna have to recognize that these are African cells, bone cells, and background proteinaceous debris is a very much indicative of this entity. Here are the African metaplastic cells a little closer. Now, again, this you know, this is also a cap stain, and you notice that they're staining more eosinophilic here, and sometimes that's because, there's, because of the degeneration. Sometimes the roots are kind of thick, and the stain doesn't penetrate completely, etc. So you can see them show up with the eosinophilic, like you do here, or basophilic, like you do here. Now, again, that's the cytophilia in the center here because of the lack of stain penetrance. But for the most part, these look basophilic. But you can still appreciate the abundant granular nature of the cytoplasm and the prominent nucleoli. Here's some more. Again, African cells and foam cells. Okay, it's going to be like a broken record. You get African metaplastic cells and foam cells. I would, you know, I would sign this out as consistent with fiber cystic changes. After I confirm what they were looking for on radiology and critical exam, right? Okay. Here's some more. Now, something you have to remember with the, all the cystic changes, the epithelial component not only undergoes metaplasia often, is it undergoes degeneration. And so some of the epithelial groups are going to be there, but they're going to look kind of degenerated and crowded. So sometimes they get hyperplastic, so they get a little bit crowded. So these just look degenerate because of all what's going on in the background. You do have all these foam cells. You've got some cellular debris. In fact, it looks like necrotic cells. And then, and that's not uncommon, all this cellular debris. So they tend to break down and undergo a lot of turnover, etc. So 
that's not uncommon, especially when you have all the cystic chains. And, uh, and again, mostly probably neck causes in the background. Now let's see the African cells here. This is just a group of regenerated ductal cells. I didn't see any myo -X, but remember what I said about, um, you know, I'm sure if we looked around elsewhere, we'd probably find a couple here and there. But the general rule with fibrocystic chains is that you don't see too many. Sometimes you don't see too many myo -X. Yes, it helps to find them, but, you know, I don't get too worried if I don't see too many. There's other disorders that you will see lots of myo -X in. But what happens when the epithelial component becomes hyperplastic? Now remember we said there's different terms for this. We've got, um, we've got mild hyperplasia, we've got moderate ephloid, and we've got atypical hyperplasia. And some folks lump all of those together into proliferative breast disease in general. But things you're going to look for on cytology include increased cellularity, some nuclear overlapping and crowding, but the group still remains elusive. That's important. You know, look for those frequency groups. If there's nuclear atypia, you got to wonder about, you know, I'm going to call that atypical. I'm not going to make a diagnosis of ABH on cytology, but I can suggest it as a possibility. If there's ABH, if, if I'm concerned about ABH on cytology, mostly I'm going to be calling it atypical because the differential includes a low-grade BCIS. And, I, and what that's going to get that patient is a biopsy, which is what she's going to get, you know, at that point. But it is important to recognize nuclear atypia in case the patient needs an additional procedure. Because remember, when they come in for a bed session, if you call it benign, they may go away and not come back for six or eight months. And you want to make sure that you're not sending them away with a cancer that's doing there, right? So it's just, uh, that's important. Uh, the, um, and of course, there are, in, in ductal hyperplasia, there may not be too many mild epithelial cells, but you, you're almost always going to be able to find one in uh, a few here and there. All right, so here's an example of hyperplasia. Again, this is a group of ductal cells. It's just a larger group. There'll be more of them, so these specimens tend to be more cellular overall. Um, and there's a little bit of nuclear overlapping and crowding here. But so can't really about it. It's still rather cohesive. There's maybe one cell here that's um, in this uh, cohesive here. But I'm not going to get too concerned about just the one cell. Here's probably a myo-X down here. And I'm sure if we kind of focus in on uh, up and down on this in the microscope, we probably see some other myo-X hanging out uh, in, out of the plane of focus. But again, this is a benign finding, this is hyperplasia. Now you'll see the same kind of appearance in other lesions, such as a fibroadenoma or a gynecomastia, which also show epithelial hyperplasia. So keep this image in mind, because you'll see it in other things as well. Now for ductal hyperplasia, again, more cellularity, more nuclear overlapping, this is actually corresponding to this biopsy. You can still see some irregularly shaped piriform spaces, but and they almost, you can almost kind of see them recapitulated here in the cytology. Again, would I call this for ductal hyperplasia on cytology? No. Would I call it hyperplasia? Yes. You know, I probably call this as hyperplastic ductal epithelial cells present, as long as I've convinced myself there's nothing else going on. Here's another example. Again, notice these are very crowded groups of epithelial, ductal epithelial cells. There's a little bit of screening here. And, this kind of, and here you see this over here. Very large uh, group of ductal cells. They're very cohesive, though, and that's a very good benign finding. Uh, there's maybe a myoepithelial cell here. Uh, so again, the cohesion uh, is a good benign finding. The myoex supports benign as well. I think there's more up here as well, even from the high, low power. The don't let the cellularity concern you or the nuclear crowding concern you, as long as there's not any individual cellular nuclear And here's another example. And this is actually from the case of a fibroadenoma. Because what do we see in the epithelial component of a fibroadenoma is hyperplasia. And again, it's a very cohesive group of ductal cells that are otherwise bland. And then you see lots of myoex both out of the plane of focus in the smaller, darker, football-shaped ones here, as well as out, maybe out here as well. It's probably a bird cell, but there may be one right here. Now, what happens when they become atypical? And then you start digging, you know, this is when you should raise that red flag and call it atypical. 
Now, you're not going to have those on your chart, okay? You're not going to have a typical leaf. You're not going to have a category of a typical fall, just like aspen and just like aspen, okay? But you still have to be familiar with it because it may come up when you're actually finding out real cases. Do I call it benign? Do I call it atypical? Or do I call it malignant? You know, those are the categories. But, you know, right now you're going to be focusing on benign and malignant, and that's good. But you still have to be wary of those that are kind of in between. Now here, you can definitely appreciate some nuclear recipients. Uh, there's pleomorphism, there's nuclear enlargement. These are definitely bigger than normal uh, uh, structural cells. Uh, they have nucleolite, they have a little bit of chromatin irregularity, there's some nuclear membrane irregularity. Over here, we're starting to see some discohesion. It's not like a real cohesive leaf anymore, uh, but there's still some cohesion. We got some mild Fs in the background, so that's good. Right? That kind of favors the nine. But the nuclear pleomorphism here is a little bit less than I would expect in something totally benign and would lead me to call it atypical. And, and in, uh, on a subsequent biopsy, which is what that atypical diagnosis would get that patient, it showed ABA. Okay. That's how I know it was ABA. All right. So going down to the neoplast benign neoplastic lesion, again, what do our benign neoplastic lesions include? Fibro uh, adenoma, uh, intraductal papilloma, and uh, benign pelodes tumor. Okay. Now, the key feature, this is a lesion you're going to have to be very comfortable with. This is going to be one of your diagnostic categories, is the fibro adenoma. Uh, the key with fibro adenomas is it's very cellular. Okay. You look at these specimens from low power and you think, oh my gosh, is it malignant? You know, that's the first thing you're going to think of because it's so cellular. But then you realize that all the epithelial groups are very cohesive. And that's a very important finding. Um, the, the sheets of, of epithelial cells are going to be quite uh, cellular as well. There may be a little bit of nuclear overlapping, but they're very cohesive and they'll show these often these little finger like projections on the borders that we refer to as either as antler horn or stag horn appearance. You'll see that term occasionally. Uh, there's often stroma in the background, because remember, fiber adenoma, it has the adenomatous component, that's the epithelium, and it has the fibrous component. So you, it's not uncommon to see stromal fragments, which comes the same metagenomic on this one. And then the other thing that's different from other benign tumors is the fact that there's n often numerous myoepithelial cells in the background. In fact, you may, well, you may just see tons of them, okay? And that's a good clue because this is the one that's resistant gynecomastia in the men uh, that tend to show a lot of myelopathelial cells. And that's always a good benign feature. Now, again, fibroadenomas can sometimes have some atypia, and, and that becomes uh, one of the most common reasons for false positive diagnosis when you start to see a few single intact cells with some nuclear atypia. In that setting, I probably mentioned the atypical features, uh, but in for your purposes right now, um, you know, as long as you, you notice fiber adenoma, if you see a few single intact cells, don't get too concerned. But sometimes they can do that. All right, so this is what I meant. This is low power image, both on this way and path, and it shows a very cellular vessel. And so the, 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 the thing to keep in mind is when you see this degree of cellularity on any breast definition, there's, just, there's two things that should come to your mind in the differential fiber adenoma and breast cancer. Okay, all right? And so you look at this and you think, you know from low power, you're not going to be able to make that distinction just yet. But even from low power, you can see that these groups, they are hydroplastic, they're very cohesive. And that favors a benign process. And then even here on the district, you see that there are numerous myelopathelial cells in the background. Even from this power, I know there's a myelopathelial cell. You know, there's, just, there's so many of them. So those are all good features for uh, fiber adenoma. Cellularity, ductal hyperplasia, uh, stag point configuration, because you can actually see little finger like projections throughout, and all the myo Fs in the background. That all favors fiber adenoma. All right, so more things about fiber adenoma. Yes, here's the ductal cells that are cohesive. Here's your stromal fragment on tab. Yes, I know, it's easier to appreciate stromal fragments on, on this trick because of the metachromatic staining for them. But you can still see them on tap. They do stain this kind of light basophilia. 
They'll have spindle cells. They're not usually very cellular, uh, but they are composed of, of, of oval to spindle shaped nuclei that represent the fibroblasts that make up the um, stromal, cell, stromal tissue. Um, and, and then, of course, the light blue um, connective tissue kind of material in the background. But, and then also, what else do we see? Bioacts, right there, there they are. All right, so stromal tissue, bioacts, hyperplastic buffer cells that are taking shape and divide. All good features for fiber adenoma. This is classic antler horn appearance, so we've got you know, so many finger lines everywhere. I mean, it's almost like this weird you know, science fiction movie kind of appearance here or something weird. Uh, but anyways, these are little numbers of cells and little capillary-like structures. And sometimes in the, with the fiber adenoma, they often get called antler horn branching or stag horn branching because they look like, you know, antlers of, of a deer. Now here's the, the stroma within the fiber adenoma on this dish that changed very nice, bright pink to purple. That's the metachromatic appearance on this dish. You've got your ductal cells here in the background. Um, again, I like the path. To evaluate the chromatin and nuclei of the, the, the ductal cells because you don't get the good nuclear features on this dish, but you definitely can appreciate the architecture very well and, and all the stromal tissue and other background material that can be appreciated on, 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 on the dish exchange. Here's another example of very uh, hyperplastic roots that you notice is mostly the flat tissue. It's just a lot of cells with little finger like projections throughout. Uh, along its borders. You've got myox in the background, and I'm, I'm sure if we focus up and down in this, we would see them out of plane focus again. Uh, again, this degree of hyperplasia is not uncommon in fiber adenoma. Now, here's an example with um, uh, the myoepithelial cells. Again, here's some stromal tissue, and there's numerous myox and very few ductal cells, and sometimes that's all you'll see. But again, the number of myoacts and stromal tissues with glandular component all would, you know, lead towards would favor this diagnosis. Here's the myoacts on Tyler Power. This is actually taken right from the old domain. Are you guys using a new domain now? Yeah, okay. I'm sure you have very, I haven't actually looked at the best track very well, but I, I would highly recommend it because I'm sure you have some great pictures in there. Have you guys seen, have you guys seen the new best track here? Is it got nice images? Yeah? I guess I should take a look, shouldn't I? <laughs> One of these days, I gotta steal it away from the fellows. So. <laughs> What's that? Good luck. <laughs> All right. uh, and again, here's an example of a fiber adenoma with a little bit of atypia. Now, notice here that the roots, of the epithelial cells, are the epithelial cells are starting to show some um, discohesion. They're starting to be a hint if you wonder if there isn't a single cell here and there. They're not really nicely packed. Anymore. Plus, they show a little bit of nuclear enlargement, intact cytoplasm. You know, that, that kind of um, you know, bothers me a little bit, but if it's only focal, I think I don't get too concerned about it. If it's all over the place, then I'm very concerned about it, and I would call it atypical. And of course, fiber adenoma can also show not only the stomach tissue, but the mucous material occasionally. Uh, that's uncommon, but I think it's important to recognize that you see this kind of material in the background. Anytime you see mucinous material, you should make a comment on it. Uh, the other benign tumor we want to mention is uh, briefly is intraductal papilloma. Again, remember these tend to occur in the larger ducts. They tend to cause bloody discharge. We often see a lot of blood in the background or other proteinaceous material because they tend to occur in cystic structures. They can be quite cellular. But the key is finding papillary, I'm sorry, papillary architecture. Now, benign versus malignant papillary structures can sometimes be a challenge on cytology, just to say the least. Um, but if you happen to see both epithelial and myoepithelial cells associated with the papillary structures, that would certainly favor a benign process. If you don't have any myoax, then I start to get a, a very concerned. But because of these challenges, Sometimes with capillary lesions on cytology as well as core tissue biopsies, we, there, it's actually recommended that we interpret these lesions as capillary lesions recommended to. Oh, so whenever I see a good capillary 
leaving this very cellular, I, I, even if I say you're benign, I still recommend a, bio, a tissue biopsy. It's just, it's, it's the very safest thing to do because, you know, these things can have focal tissue that may not be present in the cytologic sample. Who knows if you're seeing the whole thing? So that's, that's the key here. You know, the differential includes papillary carcinoma, invasive, or DCIS. But here's a classic introductory papilloma. Again, it's a very cellular, but it's, and it's composed of this very complex papillary architecture. You can see the fibrovascular pores in here. The, the fibrovascular pores tend to, tend to stay metachromatic on this one. And so you see that. But then the key is you have to look close at the, the epithelial cells that are lining these pores. And there shouldn't be any more than one or two cell layers thick, and then you should also be able to find myelopidemia cells, and there actually are some myelops in the background, to say they're benign. Right? In, in, in a setting like this, I'd probably call it a capillary lesion and say they're benign, and this lesion did turn out to be on histology and introductory papilloma. Here's another example. Now, this one's a little bit more concerning because there's a bit of dislocation here. But well, I think it's highlighting another feature that sometimes you'll see in capillary lesions. You start to see a little bit of this feature, and you start to see cells that look more columnar in shape. You know, here you actually have what looks like some African cells, but some of these other cells start to take on more of a columnar appearance to them. And that, you know, that's sometimes also clues to capillary lesion because they tend to form the epithelial cells on the fibrovascular pore tend to be kind of a tall columna appearance to them. Now what about gynecomastia? Again, what is gynecomastia going to look like on cytology? It actually says it right there on the slide. <laughs> Fibroadenoma. I mean, the exact same thing. They'll have the cellular groups of epithelial cells that are cohesive, and you'll see stromal fragments as well as numerous myelops in the background. Again, tight clusters and groups, usually quite cellular, uh, and just basically looks like a fibroadenoma. But if it's from a guy, you know what it's got to be. It's an aspect, or a guy with subareolar enlargement. Uh, here's an example. Again, stromal tissue, epithelial cells that look a little bit crowded, but still cohesive, and myoaps in the background. Here's another example. Could be one of the fibroadenomas I showed you earlier. Okay, very cellular. Uh, kind of stagform appearance to the periphery of these uh, flat, crop, slightly crowded, but very cohesive, tightly uh, cohesive groups. And then there's myoaps in the background. You can just barely see them, but they're there. I don't see any stromal tissue here, but that doesn't change my mind. I mean, sometimes you don't see much stromal. Other times you do. Remember, the stromal tissue is sometimes is a little hard to aspirate because it can be a little denser. It's hard to aspirate sometimes. Here it is on higher power, again, showing you these very tightly clustered, very bland buffer cells. There's a little bit of nuclear crowding and overlapping, but it's a cohesive group, and they show bland nuclear features, which is good. And then, of course, you have your um, some mile X in the back. Okay, any questions on benign things? We're going to start the malignant things uh, very briefly here, and then we're going to just um, address a couple things, and then we'll take a few minutes break. Okay, so breast cancer. This is now such a rule for breast cancer diagnosis. Okay, uh, well, I didn't make it up. I couldn't say that. I, I actually borrowed it, uh, these rules from, um, and I, I find it works very well for me. So I've been using it for years. Okay, um, I actually borrowed this from. I gotta find my reference here. Um, it was a conference I went to here in town. We had like there was an AFCC meeting once in here one year, and so I got a chance to go. And I listened to a conference that was given by Dr. Dukatman and Wang. Dr. Wang is from Harvard, Dr. Dukatman is from University of West Virginia. And she's done a lot, they both have done a lot in psychology and done a lot of, um, written a lot about it, and they give a lot of conferences. Um, but this really was borrowed from them. At this conference, and I really like it because they kind of broke it down into four groups of features that you need to kind of focus on to make a diagnosis of malignancy. First of all, you look at the cellular, and you, you know, you expect a breast cancer to be hypercellular. Okay. You expect the epithelial groups to be discohesive. Okay, they're not nice, you know, tightly 
fun to do this anymore. They're going to say this cohesion. They're going to be broken up. Um, you also look for single, isolated malignant cells with intact cytoplasm. So single cells with cytoplasm. Remember the myo-eps are single cells without cytoplasm. When you see single cells with cytoplasm, lots of them, that's always a red flag. And then, of course, the new theory cytium is important, right, for any malignancy. And, and it's all the features mentioned there, the new theory cytium. So, the general rules are, if you have all four of these criteria present, it's positive for malignancy. Okay? And then you come down to what type of malignancy. Is it ductal? Is it lobular? Or some other ductal variant? But you can get the malignancy, you've already made a big step. You know? Okay? If you only have three of the four criteria present, suppose you have a typical cell and isolated single cells in this position, but it's not a very cellular specimen. I don't call it outright positive. I call it suspicious for malignancy. And then the same thing is true for atypical. If I got new atypia and, and a hypercellular specimen with no diseasing, I'm not going to call it positive or suspicious. I'm going to call it atypical. Usually when you call them suspicious or atypical, that's going to give them a, a, a biopsy specimen for a more definitive interpretation. But again, you have to have all of these features present, really, all four of these general categories present to call it to be comfortable in calling it malignant. And that's basically what we see with Dr. Carcinomas. Um, and so we'll take a break right here, and let's meet back at it's 11 f according to that clock. Let's meet back at 25 f. Okay. So I mean, everyone's here, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we're on the home stretch here. Yeah. <laughs> Good for Friday afternoon, right? Um, I, you got two handouts that we passed out to. One is this uh, NCI group that put together this beautiful approach to breast definition psychology. It's, um, it's probably the best, most complete article out there, even though it's from 1997. It's still, there's nothing else like it since. Okay, so it's a very good reference. And then this other article is actually a handout from the lecture I gave. Uh, you know, Will Fortell used to actually have annual psychology review courses that would last for a whole week. Um, staff from different places would come, residents would go there, so all the students would participate. And it actually be offered by the civilian folks in the area, too, including the students that, that used to be at UC. They don't have a school there anymore. But, um, and so I actually gave this lecture back in 2003. That's why it's such a program director of the U.S. Army School, which I guess it will, will be now next, uh, next year again, right? <laughs> no. No, more, no more Navy next year. Okay. Uh, but, um, but no, it, it, that used to be its first name. When I first started, it was called the U.S. Army School. So I was like, oh, it used to be a program director, as well as the medical director. I wore two hats, so uh, up until about 2004 when Sheepshaker took over the program director position. I just thought it clarified it. <laughs> it was from a, a, almost 10 years ago at this point. But it's still, all the information that's in this handout is actually in, and most of it is in your handout that you have in your book. It's nothing, it really isn't anything new. It may have a, expanded on a couple other items, but it's really not. It's that you have all the same information. All right. Um, so, talking about ductal cancer. Again, which is the most common type. You notice how the slide here says ductal carcinoma NLS. And why is that? And the, the, point, the point about um, ductal carcinoma and psychology is that once you recognize it as ductal carcinoma, you can't really make the distinction between in situ and invasive carcinoma on psychology because they can have very similar features. And that's part of the reason why the, the radiologists have kind of taken over our business a little bit. 
Because on the core biopsy, in most cases, you can make that distinction. And that can sometimes make a difference whether or not they're going to do, and actually it would often make a difference, whether or not they're going to do sensory or no extension or not at the time of their uh, lumpectomy and mastectomy. So, but you can still recognize ductal carcinoma with the globulin, and we'll talk about that next. Uh, the, these are the general features of ductal carcinoma. It's very cellular. In fact, it meets all the criteria we've all already talked about for malignancy. It's very cellular. It will have a, a uniform, homogeneous population of atypical cells and uh, numerous single cells with intact cytoplasm, uh, dyshesion of all the epithelial group, absent myo-X, that's what's meant by absent band nuclei, usually, uh, nuclear enlargement, nuclear irregular nuclear membrane, nucleoli, eccentric nuclear placement are all features, and you may have a necrotic or tumor diaphysis backbone. Not always, if it's there, it's, it's very helpful. So here's some examples. Very cellular aspirin. Uh, you look at this at low power, and remember what are the things that can be cellular? Cancer and fibroadenoma. Now, but even from this power, you can start to see, you know, there's not, there's some irregularity to the way these groups are. There's smaller groups out here. There's even an individual cell here. So it's definitely showing some different features than the, the fibroadenoma from earlier. Higher power will highlight the fact that there's more uh, looseness to the groups. Uh, we've got some acinal formation remaining here uh, that, you know, goes along with its regular features, but there's definitely looseness. Like they're not nice, tight clusters anymore. There's individual cells, like you see here, and there's nuclear atypia. It's not pronounced here, but you can definitely appreciate some uh, nuclear enlargement, some nuclear membrane irregularities, um, and maybe, um, and then some tiny nuclei, but nothing real prominent. Here's, in contrast, this one has a lot of nuclear atypia. These are very anatoxic looking cells, very crowded, disordered groups. If you saw this from any cytology site, you would oh, definitely malignant. And it shows features of an endocarcinoma, right? It's got smoother borders, it's got eccentric nuclear placement, it's got some granular, hopefully evacuated cytoplasm. So, you know, again, this is a type of endocarcinoma. This one happens to be more high grade. Now, again, Janae likes to focus on, um, this is from the old, his old book, um, you know, he's, he basically says lots of cells to look at. So in other words, it's very cellular, lots of individual cells, um, this cohesive groups, and uh, again, it really highlights all these individual cells with intact cytoplasm. But in addition to that, he wants that look malignant, right? That makes sense. Lots of cells to look at that look malignant. Sounds too easy, doesn't it? Okay. And, and again, what we see here on higher power are individual cells with high MC ratio, nuclear pleomorphism, enlargement, uh, primitive irregularity. You've got a targetory mucin backdoor here, which is also a feature to look for. Uh, it's reported that when you see these kind of targetory backdoors in the cytoplasm, that favors the presence of invasion. Now, again, we still can't make that distinction with absolute certainty on cytology because I can see similar features in insightful testimony as well. But it, it has been reported that that favors an invasive test. Okay. Low nuclear grade, you've got subtle nuclear atypia. Look at the double little numbers here. <laughs> Same chromatin irregularities, but they don't look too bad otherwise. They look pretty monotonous actually, but they definitely have nuclear atypia. Um, High nuclear grade is the other opposite spectrum of lots of narcotic activity and a classic form marked nuclear and intipia. Alright, so this is this should be pretty straightforward. One field is benign, one field is malignant. Okay. Which one is which? So which one? Less benign, right malignant. Okay, good. You know, and be aware that sometimes you'll have the nine cells in the background of a malignancy, and you can use that for comparison. And you may not always have it, but it helps. And again, you notice a nice flat, cohesive, monolayer sheet, honeycomb pattern, etc., etc., round, regular nuclei, and then over here, gosh, there's no order to this, this distribution. Those single cells are very pleomorphic, with very malignant looking nuclear features. Shouldn't give anyone a challenge, right? Well, 
Incitement carcinoma, again, as I already mentioned, it's impossible on cytology to distinguish it from invasive cancer. And we don't even try. So when I call these, I find them on malignant cells present consistent with ductal carcinoma. Okay, that's it. But I mean, some time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, recommend radiologic clinical colleagues, blah, blah, blah. But the, uh, the, uh, but this is, you know, I can't tell whether it's invasive or incisive. The other thing is, it's also very difficult to distinguish low grade DCIS from ADN or atypical, atypical ductal hypertension. That's when you really need the biopsy. But if you recognize a tibia, then it's important to call it atypical so the patient will get the appropriate biopsy follow up. Now, comedal carcinoma, you're going to have to learn to recognize. That one you will have to recognize because it actually will show some interesting features. First of all, it's the one that will actually show a lot of cellular debris, diathesis like appearance in the background. Because if you remember, what, what do the central ducts show? All that necrosis. So what are you going to see in the background? All that necrotic debris. But in addition, remember I told you on histology that cells that line or make up the comedal carcinomas are very anaplastic type grade. And so you're going to see very large pleomorphic cells. And then calcium is also, you may see some what's called casting calcium, um, I'm sorry, not on histology, it's on mammogram. But you may see some calcified deposits throughout the background as well. Because remember, they tend to show a lot of abnormal calcification that will often take its casting appearance on mammogram where it actually tracks the long duct. Now, the low grade PCISs are very hard uh, in general. I mean, you might recognize some in tibia. Um, I would hope, and you would definitely need a biopsy for that one, but uh, I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, an example in just a moment. And of course, invasive carcinoma. If you actually see tumor cells infiltrating stromal fragments, that's a sign of invasion, right? And, and then I mentioned to you the targetory mucin vacuum is, a, is also a clue. Of course, if it's a if clinical findings reveals a dense, hard, immobile, large palpable mass in the breast, that is most likely to be invasive. Okay, remember what I said about in situ lesions? Do they use, are they usually palpable? No. Okay, but so again, you have to correlate these things all with the clinical and imaging findings to, to get to diagnosis. Now, so this was an FNA of a patient uh, who had a non palpable lesion, so it was done by image guidance. She had abnormal calcifications, uh, and this is what it showed. It showed all this necrotic debris in the background. You got these very crowded groups of anaplastic um, epithelial cells. Uh, you may have some calcified debris in the background as well as hemorrhage. So this was an example of comedial carcinoma. It's a high-grade DCIS with abundant necrosis in the background. This is a low-grade DCIS. This is a little bit more challenging because guess what? There's some cohesion. There's definitely cohesion to these groups. They're not discohesive. They're not. There's only slight crowding. There's even myel X. Okay, I know. DCIS will sometimes show myel X. Because remember, the DCIS is not invading outside the dot, it remains confined to the dot, and so you may have, you're going to expect to see myelin static appearances. So if you see some, that's okay, but there's usually not a lot. But the key here is that there's definitely a tibia, and um, there's um, enlarged nuclei that are pleomorphic with chromatin irregularities, um, nucleoli, uh, crowding, uh, nuclear enlargement, so all of those things would you would definitely call, I would definitely call this a typical, but this did turn out to be a local DCIS. And there's a hint of a triple-form space here. Remember, I told you one of the low-grade DCIS has a triple-form pattern. Here's another example, but you got more of these features here. you got more single cells with impact cytoplasm that are not myelex, and you got some mitotic activity. Now, and also nuclear tissue, but it's one as well. But it's definitely there. Uh, here's some of these targetoid vacuoles that are in examples of ductal carcinoma. Here it is on tap. Here it is on uh, diplic. It tends to stay metachromatic. The mucin needs to tail, even with you know, the little mucin droplet in the vacuole. And again, it's been reported that these kind of favor an invasive process of receiver. Now, these targetoid vacuoles are not specific for either ductal or lobular carcinoma because you can also see them in lobular. 
Now, here are all the variants of Dr. Kaishiro. We went through um, all of these earlier. I'm just going to show a few cytological examples. Uh, again, medullary, what do you expect to see? Lots of lymphocytes in the background that are benign. And um, these kind of syncytial, sometimes loose groups of very high grade uh, malignant cells with more vesicular open chromatin, but uh, with very large anaplastic uh, nuclei. So, very high grade epithelial cells and benign lymphocytes, and the abundant lymphocytes in the background, which suggests medullary. Um, colloid or mucinous carcinoma, again, what do we see? All this mucinous material that tends to stain metachromatic in the background, and then you often see the malignant epithelial cells embedded within the mucinous material, both as single cells as well as um, small, small to large groups that kind of grow. Here it is on top. Again, all of this blue material represents the mucinous material of a colored carcinoma. And here too, and again you notice these, the atypia and the individual cells that help you get to outright malignant. Now I mentioned the tubular carcinoma is basically a type of variant that shows abundant, well-formed, small tubules infiltrating throughout the dense stroma. And sometimes what you'll see, uh, what we recapitulate is little tubules right here. And sometimes they take what's called a shape of a cornucopia. That thing that you have a Thanksgiving, you know, the, the basket. It kind of looks like it has one dilated end and then one pointy end. Or it's kind of like comma shape. Like it, it almost looks like a big comma. Here. So, anyways, I just thought that these are, these are hard. On, I mean, they're hard on histology, uh, let alone cytology. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to tell you that right now. I mean, if, if you can get to malignant, God bless you. That's all I can say. <laughs> because they are so subtle. They, they are really bland. Okay, they are so bland. But you're always going to find some nuclear tissue. There may be a few individual intact cells that have some nuclear tissue. But these are hard. And oftentimes they get called atypical, which sometimes they're mixed. So it's another one of those life point diseases that likes to that ends up being a false negative. Here's some more examples. But this is nice because it compares the malignant group to the benign. And here you see the small size of the nuclei that are most popular. And yes, it's a part of group, but they're much smaller. And then the larger size of the malignant. Um, yeah, very bland, but um, still atypical enough to be of concern. And then there's some individual cells within text cytoplasm. And generally, no myelin. They're helpful to look for, no myelin. All right, what about papillary? Again, papillaries tend to be very cellular, and, and you also tend to see a lot of hemorrhage in the background. Uh, these are very uh, crowded groups here. We've got little papillary uh, nubbins. We've got sheets that look papillary with fibrovascular pores. We've got individual cells. We've got all this blood and necrosis in the background. Uh, you don't really see, you know, it doesn't have the nice... Yes, you can appreciate the capillary architecture, but it doesn't really have the nice one or two cell layers thick surrounding the fibrovascular pores anymore. It's much more cellular than that. And it's missing myelin. And so that all leads towards malignancy. Here's another example on capillary. Again, look at how complex the structure is with capillary configuration, finger like projections. But in addition, you start to see some individual cells out to the periphery with intact cytoplasm, nuclear atypia, very crowded, in large nuclei, etc. Again, how would I say this case out? Capillary lesion, recommend biopsy. <laughs> okay? But this actually did turn out to be a capillary carcinoma. The other thing is, as I mentioned to you, that sometimes these cells take on a columnar, a tall columnar appearance. Um, and that's what we're seeing here, right here, this little group here. This is a nice capillary structure. We've got an individual cell. We've got lots of blood in the background. We've got a hemocytin laid in macrophage. But then you've got these little sheets of tall columnar cells. Sometimes they'll line up like a picket fence. And that's supposedly a feature of capillary carcinoma of the breast too. Here it is on cell block. Okay. Yeah, very cellular. You can definitely appreciate the capillary architecture. You've got foamy macrophages in the center of the fibrovascular pores. That's not a specific finding, but you see that in a lot of capillary tumors. 
Um, and you're missing, you really don't see the mile X, which is, you know, you want to see those to have a divine dimension. Here's another example that's highlighting the crowded epithelial cells that line these capillary pores, fibrovascular pores. And then you've got the nice smaller groups of this tall columnar cell, almost to the tenth arrangement, which is a, another two tiny capillary. All right, what about inflammatory carcinoma? Now, I have to tell you right off the bat that inflammatory carcinoma is more of a, um, a clinical diagnosis and a histologic diagnosis. But because uh, here, as I showed you one earlier, where you have the, the ductal type cells within the dermal, superficial dermal lymphatic is upside down. This is the skin surface here. This is the deeper dermis filled with the lymphatic showing cancer here. Um, and so you're thinking, well, what? Who would do an FNA? Well, well, so here's the point. So people doing FNA is are suspected inflammatory carcinoma. And they do, they take these very small, almost virtually sized needles and do very superficial FNAs into just, you know, just to use the epidermis. I don't know how they do that. Okay, I've never done that before. But, you know, and so supposedly what you see is basically ductal carcinoma. And that's what we're seeing here. But I have to tell you, this diagnosis is, is a clinical and a, and a histologic diagnosis. And sometimes it's just a clinical diagnosis depending on the patient's findings. Um, but all, all you're going to see is, again, groups of malignant ductal cells primarily that are supposedly the lysis that they're sampling from these dermal lymphatics. But the, the key is when, when you see this, um, it most often indicates a breast, a primary tumor mass elsewhere in the breast. And that's the same this is cancer. Okay. Oh, this is a great case, actually. I have this from Triple and I actually think I have the black tie for you today. Um, this is a case that actually Dr. Sanger did a case report on. Uh, he's going to No, I'm just kidding. It's a very good one. He, he had the histology, I had the psychology. We, we, we kind of collaborated on it. But um, this is such a fascinating case. I always try to say this has never happened before to me, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there's been other case reports like it. The, um, I was called to do this FNA on this patient. She's like a 55, 60 year old woman who presented to the ER with chest pain. So, you know, what happens when you present with chest pain? You get an admission overnight into the CCU to rule out an MI. Okay? So that's what they admitted it for. They rule out an MI. They ruled out an MI. And they did as part of their workup, they were doing thallium scans at that time to look at the heart function. And they, during the midst of doing the thallium scan, they um, they found that it was lighting up her, her breast. They're like, what's going on? So then they decided to actually do a physical exam um, <laughs> and found that she has like eight centimeter rock hard mass in her breast. Okay. And then they wanted me to put a needle in it. This thing felt like foam. Okay. It really did. And I'm like, oh, no way. Okay. But I tried. I did. I gave it the good old college try. Okay. And, and I, I actually did get some cells, as you see, but it was quite the challenging case. And basically, what I got here is this is both uh, from this case. This is one area that I got, and this is actually an osteoclast type cell, multi-mutated giant cell. Um, it's a benign cell. It was just there for, because this lesion, because it was just, the reason why it was so hard, is because it actually had bony tissue in it, in the breast. Yeah. And then, and then there were these single cells with very high NC ratio in the nuclear tissue, but there were also these groups, like here, crowded groups of cells, very bizarre looking cells, a lot of background necrosis, kind of this medical, some of these bizarre cells were embedded within this metachromatic stroma, and it was really bizarre. And what this ended up being is basically um, what we call a metaplastic breast carcinoma, which is essentially a, a, a carcinoma that has this malignant um, spindle cell component. Looks like partial cells in a way, but it's actually, we found that it's still of epithelial origin, so it's called metaplastic breast carcinoma. And it actually did have osseous tissue in it, as I mentioned earlier, which is not an uncommon finding in metaplastic breast carcinoma, but it also had this malignant spindle cell component. So I, was, I sweat about this one because I actually, this one kept me awake at night for a few days. I am. Um, I called it, I, I convinced myself it was malignant, and um, even though it wasn't all that cellular, probably the groups that I'm showing you here are some of the best groups, it, it didn't really have a whole lot. It had a lot of these osteoclast-like cells. 
but there were enough to get to know you. We've had clinical findings that sort of went along with that. Um, and I called it and I suggested the possibility of, um, um, you know, this type of cancer and some others that can have osteoclast like giant cells associated with them. And, um, and yes, it did turn out to be an um, excision with metaplastic breast cancer. So I felt much better after not for the case of that thing at all. I was like, I was so worried that it, it was going to turn out to be something really different, I think. But I had no worries. Um, I don't know how the patient is doing, but she provided a very interesting story that I've been sharing a number of years now. And I do have this uh, kind of a bowel the um, uh, And here's an example of Paget's disease. Now, again, remember Paget's the bowel and nipple? And you can sometimes get these from doing scrapes of the nipple. I'm not sure if I'm very comfortable with this. Uh, but uh, basically what you're going to see, just like you saw in the vulva area, is these large, pleomorphic anaplastic cells, often isolated or in small groups, and very prominent, uh, large nuclei with prominent nucleoli, uh, lots of cytoplasm, and that's what we're looking for. What we're looking for. Now, what about lobular? Again, just a little bit. Uh, Lobular, so if you're really going to, again, it's another type of cancer. It's another kind that we really, it's harder to make the distinction. You can't make a distinction between invasive and excisive, just like with ductal. But it is important to distinguish it from ductal in general, okay? Um, in contrast to ductal, we tend to be low cellular specimens with poor cell yield. The cells tend to be smaller. Uh, they can even occur in single piles on cytology. Cytoplasm is scanty, often indistinct. The nuclei are smaller, darker, more uniform in appearance in many cases. They can show nuclear molding, and they will show other nuclear tissue to, to help you with the diagnosis of malignancy. Occasionally, they'll show up as signet ring cells with intracytoplasmic mucin that looks like carboplate vessels, just like I showed you earlier in the ductal cells, but they tend to be smaller cells and they'll take a classic signet ring appearance. So, Whenever I see cells that look like signet ring cells on a breast specimen, I think of either lobular or a MET from somewhere else. A MET from a GI tract, a MET from a lung, you know, just something okay, but other than breast. But what I have found in my experience is when I see lots of signet ring cells, you got to think lobular, number one. And as we mentioned earlier, it's a frequent cause of false negative because of the low cellularity and some of the blandness to the nuclei. The differential includes lymphoma, small cells, and uh, as well as uh, ductal carcinoma. Here's some examples. Again, on the very high power, it was just showing you kind of a, a small, uh, elongated, uh, loose aggregate of cells that are showing nuclear molding. Kind of when you look at it, you think, wow, is that small cell carcinoma? Right? Kind of looks like that. So anytime I see something that looks like small cell carcinoma in the breast, it's either breast primary or metastatic lung. Reason, okay, I've, I've seen that a couple times. But um, in contrast to small cell carcinoma of the lung, you, most cases you can make out chromatin detail and nucleoli and some particular mucin vectors in the lobular carcinoma that you wouldn't see in a lung small cell carcinoma. Here's some more examples of our signet ring cells. And again, you see these nice signet ring cells in small groups and forming these kind of elongated clusters like this and composing only one or two cells thick. Um, same globular. Here it is on his side. Here's some more, again, from Demay, the old Demay, showing the particle vacuous and this single file, or single file of it. You can still see some nuclear tissue that's going to help you get to the diagnosis of malignancy. We don't have much cytoplasm. Again, that's in contrast to ductal. We don't have as much pleomorphism as that cytoplasm. So, with that, one is ductal, one is lobular. Which is which? What's that? The one on the left is all right. Everyone agree? Okay. This, this is lobular, this is ductal. Presuming they're at about the same magnification, you notice that these cells are larger. They have more cytoplasm and more pleomorphism than the cells that we see over here. They tend to be smaller, higher in C ratio, less cytoplasm. They have lots of particle vacuoles, almost with a signet ring appearance. And that, you know, you see a lot of that, and they have more bland nucleus. So that all favors lobby. 
All right, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these other unusual tumors, but you have to be aware that they do occur, and including mets can occur to the breast. Uh, here's an example of a large cell lymphoma. We haven't done the lymph point block yet, but we've seen some lymphomas already on cytokines. Does anyone know what these um, pale blue structures here are in the back? Lymphoglandular bodies. You haven't, maybe you haven't heard that term yet. All they represent are little pieces of the lymphoid cytoplasm. And, and so it's, uh, it's not uncommon that you see them in lymphoid leakers, whether benign or malignant. And we'll talk about that again in, in, in the different lymphoid lectures. But that's part of the clue that you're dealing with something lymphoid when you see all those lymphoglandular bodies in the back. Now, lymphoid cells tend to show up as single cells. that goes along with their lymphoid origin. Here's Hodgkin's disease. We look for what's called a, we have the uh, reactive lymphoid background with this large weak primrose cell. Uh, that's the cell of, of the Newcastle cell in the uh, disorder Hodgkin's disease. And you'll, you'll learn about this more when you do the lymphoid block or lymphoid module. Angiosarcoma is a vascular neoplasm that can occur in the breast. We've got lots of blood in the background. It tends to be bloody and necrotic. But often you get these glomeruloid formations of aggregates of spindle cells that you see here that have malignant looking nucleus. It looks like it almost like a glomerulus from the kidney. You know, the way it's aggregated together. And the cells are the nuclei of spindle. There's mites here. That's not good. When you see spindle cells and mites, never good. <laughs> All right. Now, a little bit about Pelodes tumor, because, you know, we talked about this earlier. I lumped it under the malignant category here, because, but remember that the, there are both benign and malignant uh, forms of Pelodes tumor. Um, it's a biphasic tumor, like the fiber adenomas. It has both an epithelial and a stromal component. But what distinguishes a benign Pelodes from a fiber adenoma is the, 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 the amount of stroma, the amount of cellularity, I should say, within the stromal component. Lodi's tumors have more cellularity to the stroma than a fibroadenoma. Otherwise, the ductal component looks exactly the same. It tends to be hyperplastic ductal epithelial component. It's just the stromal component tends to be, there tends to be more stromal fragments, and they tend to be more cellular. And then when you look at the stromal component, you, you start to see the particular and pleomorphism and mitosis in the stromal component. That's when you have to be worried about a malignant pelodes tumor. Okay. Um, so it, again, the cytological, the epithelial component is similar to fiber adenoma. And we often we refer to those cellular stromal fragments in pelodes tumors as pelodes fragments. You'll hear that doesn't in the very, very atypical pleomorphic spindle cells. And the more atypical you see, the more likely it is to be malignant. Here is an example of Lodi's tumor. I actually have this case here to show you. Um, here's a crowded but cohesive group of epithelial cells. You can see some mild apps in the background, see, um, just like you would in fiber And you look at key with the Lodi's is the stromal fragments here. They tend to be more cellular. You see more spindle cells. They tend to be more of these fragments. Um, so you see less of the metachromatic thing in stroma because there's more cells, basically. And again, if they distance from a benign one, but again, if I start to see um, pleomorphism, isolated cells, mitosis, that makes me worry. Like here, here's an example of a malignant Lodi's tumor. This is one of those stromal fragments, and you're like, wow, very cellular. We've got dyskinesia, we've got single cells falling off. Um, they've got pleomorphism. Here, again, you can see the pleomorphic nature to some of the cells. But the epithelial component is benign. Nets do occur in the breast. They're rare. Uh, most common in the women are those listed there. And then most common in the man is a prostate cancer. I've got a few examples to show you. Here's an example of metastatic melanoma. Melanoma can show up anywhere. Okay? You never can forget about melanoma. What you got here are mostly single cells. Remember, they tend to occur as single cells. Some are binucleated. They often have eccentric nuclear placement, prominent nucleoli. 
Uh, presence of melanin pigment would help, but you don't necessarily, I mean, probably only about 30 or 40 percent of the time do you see melanin pigment. Uh, uh, intermediate inclusion can be tricky. I don't see any here that I can show you. But um, these are, and they tend to have this amorphous cytoplasm. Metastatic small cell carcinoma, again, crowded groups, hypochromatic nuclei, nuclear uh, molding is quite pronounced here, mitotic activity is pronounced. Uh, you don't really see good chromatin detail in nucleoli, which is something which is characteristic of neuroendocrine tumors. Here's another example on CAT scan, and you can appreciate the neuroendocrine chromatin pattern a lot better. It's definitely got that uh, spectacular appearance, you know, coarse. Fine, alternating with fine chromatin throughout the nucleus, but it's mostly coarse here. And angulated looking cells and nuclear uh, molded. Uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma to the breast. That could happen. You can't forget your squamous features, although this one's kind of hard. Uh, but you look for hard cytoplasm, right? Okay. And you look for these tadpole shaped cells. That, um, this would be challenging. I think I could definitely get some malignant. I'm here, and I, I want to see more, but definitely this was an example of spraying itself to the breast. Now, this was a challenging case. I have to tell you, this is a case I had at William Beaumont when I did this afternoon, and they didn't tell me her history, that she had a history of bladder cancer when I did the afternoon. And so when I got all these cells like this, you know, I was, initially I was saving this to be ductal cancer. It turns out that it was metastatic urothelial cell carcinoma. Kind of makes it a little bit challenging because they do, they kind of look similar, don't they? <laughs> Lots of single cells, eccentric nuclear placement, high MC ratios, even a hint of a targetoid vacuole hit. I mean, gosh. Uh, and, and until I knew that patient's history, which is so important, um, which I didn't have at the time in the afternoon to see it, but I did before I signed it out, which is true. Um, it was. Um, I, it could have been, I could, you could have signed this out as a doctor carcinoma. Again, be aware of the limitations in breast FNA. Uh, we've already talked about all of these for the most part. You can't really distinguish in situ from invasive carcinoma on cytology. You will get to malignancy, and that's, you know, you'll either call it ductal or lobular or one of the variants of ductal. Uh, you should be able to recognize two needle carcinoma on cytology. It's hard to distinguish atypical hyperplasias from low-grade DCIS. Most are called atypical. Capillary lesions are called just that. If you recognize lots of capillary structures with atypia, it's best to call it that and recommend a biopsy. Uh, same thing with the ADH. Lactational changes can um, you know, cause us for overcalling. Breast FNAs are uh, something to be aware of the additional changes that you see with lactation, including single cells, uh, making nuclei of the, of the epithelial cells, and the background bubbly appearance from all the secretory material can help you. Lobular carcinomas are the most common cause for false negatives because of low cellular. Fibroadenomas are very cellular, and they can have some focal atypia that can be a cause for false positives. Now, the NCI report there does go through a uh, description of specimen adequacy and then the general diagnostic categories we like to use, benign, atypical, suspicious, malignant, unsought, and then give a reason. And then, of course, the descriptive findings. Um, the important thing with breast FNA is to always correlate it with the imaging findings and the psychotic uh, physical exam. That's what's referred to as a triple test. And the goal is to help reduce both the false negative and false positive findings and in increase the overall accuracy of the procedure. Triple test diagnosis has actually been shown to have as much accuracy as a surgical biopsy. Okay? Um, and so I think that you know, if you look at all these other procedures for diagnosing breast cancer, um, how patient has a very high health rate. Mammogram, anyway, now they're better quality. I think this is older data. In fact, I know it's older data. Um, now the false negative rate is closer to the 10% size. Um, even core biopsies have a false negative rate. They may not sample the right area. FNA is anywhere from 3 to 5%. And it, but if you apply the triple test approach, you should be able to reduce that to 1%. And again, what does it mean to follow the triple test approach? If you have all benign triplets, meaning benign psychology, benign imaging findings, 
and benign clinical findings, the patient is usually recommended to return to a clinical follow-up clinical breast exam within a period of six months. If they're all malignant, then we've got malignant mammographic findings, malignant appearing, you know, feels like a concerning breast mass, and clinical exam, along with malignant, malignant cytology, that patient can be referred for definitive surgical therapy. And then if they're mixed, that's when we recommend an excisional model. You know, what if you've got what looks like negative cytology, but the clinical and imaging findings are suspicious? You know, she's still needs uh, something done in addition. And here's a chart that's taken right from that, um, right from the, the um, feel comfortable with breast psychology diagnosis after you see some glass slides. Okay, remember, you know, we're going to focus on in the workshop looking at benign and then malignant. And in the benign categories, you're going to need to learn what normal looks like along with fiber changes, fiber adenomas, lactating changes, um, fat necrosis, And then in the malignancies, you gotta first of all be able to recognize it's malignant and distinguish between ductal and lobular, and maybe recognize a couple variants like the colloid, medullary, um, and some of, and maybe some of the other unusual tumors. But those are the big, those are the main categories. Something happened. Pelodes tumor. You need to recognize pelodes tumor. Okay. I think those are your main categories, and we're gonna look at examples. All right, let's take a break until 2.20, and we'll meet at the microphone. 